the digital age. Yes, exactly. You know, you don't try. A Sahabi of the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam, one of the companions of the Prophet, and it was suggested to me to talk about Khalid bin Walid, but I actually suggested another Sahabi, and I'll explain why I suggested a different Sahabi uh, to talk about or to review his life. Uh, we know most of the what we may call the senior Sahabis. Abu Bakr, Omar, Uthman, Ali, Khalid ibn Walid, Amr ibn al But there are what I may call junior Sahabis, Sahabis who were born, uh, or when the Prophet وسلم, died, they were young Sahabis. And it is very important to know also the life and the biographies of those Sahabis, because it would benefit us a lot to link to see the link between the first generation of the Sahaba and the Prophet وسلم, the second generation, and to see always a link between one generation and another in the history of Islam. So today, uh, I selected the Sahabi, his name Al-Miswar ibn Makhrama. Why I selected him? Because he, when the Prophet وسلم, died he was young and he was born in the second year of al hijrah so when the prophet died he was about nine eighty nine years old not very uh, not in his teens yet but at the same time he was a faqih a scholar of the second generation of the prophet after the prophet and his senior companions and as we review his life, we will benefit a lot, as I said, to see the link and also to see some Islamic events from the perspective of the junior Sahabis. Al Miswar ibn Makhrama was born from Quraysh. He was from the same tribe, tribe as the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. And it is also important when you look at the biographies of the Sahaba of the Prophet وسلم, to look at their lineage. You will see that they were related to each other. In this case, Al Miswar ibn Makhrama, he is the uh, cousin of Sa'd ibn Abi Waqqas. He is also his uncle, is Abdul Rahman ibn Awf. So the, you will, this is important to see the link and to ensure. Because sometimes we look at the first generation and we lose the sight of the generations who basically were the members of the team who worked very hard after the first generation. His father was among the leaders of Quraysh and he did not become a believer till late when the Prophet وسلم, retook Mecca. So, and his father was known to be a tough person, not a well-mannered person. In fact, one of the hadith of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, Al-Makhrama came to the Prophet and the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam gave him a gift to please him. So when he was pleased, the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said to him, I kept this especially for you. And he, after the conquering of Mecca, he attended with the Prophet, the father attended with the Prophet and the son, the young son attended with the Prophet the Battle of Hunayn near Taif. And he was one of Al Mu'allafati Qulubuha, those whom the Prophet وسلم, tried to make them, to uh, attract them to Islam. He gave him 50 camels. So it's a big gift uh, in that days. And he died uh, in the year 54 of Al Hijra at the age of 115, maybe 115, 110, but he was very old. Person. And uh, we said that Al Miswar was born in the second year of Al Hijrah. And he came to Medina uh, with his father, and he saw the Prophet وسلم, and narrated some hadith from the Prophet, what he saw as a young person, as a young man. Bukhari, for example, has about 40 hadith that relate either narrated by Miswar or relating to an issue that he was involved with. So do not think that young men 
do not make they have observation and the miswa was very observant and this is why uh, you will see a lot of the hadith very important hadith and sometimes different narration he is giving different angles to the issues and uh, some of it for example he said one time I was with the Prophet وسلم, and I have I was holding or carrying a heavy stone and my dress fell down and I continued doing this. The Prophet وسلم, said to him, go back to your clothes, put it on, and never walk naked. Don't walk uncovered. So this is some of the hadith that uh, Miswar narrated. Also, he narrated an incident that happened to him, I mentioned it earlier, that the Prophet وسلم, were was presented with a gift. What was this gift? Dresses gilded with gold. This an adornment. And when Al Miswar heard about this, his father, Nahrama, said to his son, Take me, because his father was blind. Take me to the Prophet. So we get our share. He was not someone who would hesitate. He was always like this. And when we went to the house of the Prophet وسلم, my father said to me, call him. And I hesitated to call the Prophet. There were no rings, no bells at that time. And the house, some, many of the houses has no doors. It was just a curtain. So he said, I hesitated to call the Prophet, to shout. And my father said to him, uh, he said to me, إِنَّهُ لَيْسَ بِجَبَّارِ He is not arrogant. Call him. He won't mind. <laughs> So I called the Prophet وسلم, and the Prophet came out and with his hand they dress and he showed it to my father with the bottom, uh, golden buttons. He, he showed the buttons to my father. He knew the Prophet وسلم, was always, uh, un he understood the personality of each of his companions or those around him. So he showed it to him. Look what I kept for you. And he, my father was all smiles. Because this is a very nice gift. And my, the Prophet وسلم, said, Radiya Mahrama. Now Mahrama is very content <laughs> because of the gift. Also, even beyond the Prophet, وسلم, Miswar was keen to learn fiqh, tafsir, as we shall see. And he, he learned some of it from his uncle. The young Sahabis asked always, those who seniors, what about this, what about that? And one of the issues that he asked his uncle, uh, Abdullah, uh, Abdurrahman ibn Awf, he said to him, in Surah Al-Imran, what was the story in the battle of Uhud, the second battle, major battle in Islam? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, وَإِذْ غَدَوْتَ مِنْ أَهْلِكَ تُبَوْهِ الْمُؤْمِنِينَ مَقَاعِدَ لِلْكِتَابِ And when you went and prepared the believers for the fight, then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said, إِذْ هَمَّتْ طَائِفَتَانِ مِنْكُمْ أَنْ تَفْشَلَا وَاللَّهُ وَلِيُّكُمَا وَضْلِيُّهُمَا وَعَلَى اللَّهِ فَلْيَتَوَكَّلِ الْمُؤْمِنُونَ And there were two groups among you that basically thought about uh, uh, withdrawing, about not going into the fight. What are, who are those two groups? He was asking his uncle because his uncle attended the battle. And the... Uh, the uncle said to him, there were two groups of Al-Ansar, Banu Salama and Banu Haritha. They thought about why we are into this. But Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala supported them and they went into the battle with the Prophet sallallahu And after the death of the Prophet sallallahu Al-Miswar was very near to Umar ibn Khattab. He don't think that when you look at the biography of Umar ibn Khattab and his accomplishment, he didn't accomplish it single-handed. He has a, a group around him, and most of them were young Sahabis, who, whom the Umar trusted and liked, and he uh, basically gave them the tasks, and they accomplished the tasks. So Al-Miswar was very near to Umar ibn Khattab, attending his decisions. Umar was uh, known for his quick decision and right decision. Sometimes if you make a hasty decision, you do not make the right decision. 
that Umar radiallahu anh, was a person who, who had a good thinking and he would understand the situation very quickly. And he, um, Al-Miswar said, I was very near to Umar ibn Khattab learning from him piety. Because Umar was very careful about doing anything wrong. So I learned from him to be cautious. And Umar also valued the traits and the manners and the character of Al-Miswar. One time, Umar ibn Khattab was presented with a gift and following the sunnah of the Prophet وسلم, he immediately distributed among the believers. What were these gifts? Some cloth from Yemen. And he, there was, they were equal. They are all the same qualities. Then there was one dress that was better than the rest of it. And Umar was thinking, whom should I give this to? If I give it to this, the other would say, why you give so he said, today I'm going to do something different. I'm going to give this to a young Sahabi, not to the senior Sahabis, but I'm going to give this to a senior, to young Sahabi. And who do you suggest? He asked the people around him, who do you suggest? And they all concurred al misra So he gave it to him. Who saw him, uh, who saw that address? His cousin, Sa'ad ibn Abi Waqqas. So when he said, where did you get this dress? Well, I got it from Umar, gave it to me. How come your dress is better than mine? He went to Umar and protested. And he said to him, "My, you give uh, him better than me? And Umar explained to Sa'ad that I was reluctant to give it to any one of you because then you would feel that I was not fair. So I gave it to a young Sahab. Let them see our appreciation. Sa'ad ibn Abi Waqqas uh, was not happy. When he heard, when he saw that decision, he was not happy. So he said, Umar did this, I'm going to hit him with my stick. <laughs> and so he said, but to Umar, I made an oath that I'm going to hit you. As Umar said to him, go, but be, 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 be careful. <laughs> Just, so this is uh, the attitude, the team that was around Umar and the young Sahabis. Also, and this one, when Umar started sending uh, the Muslims to Iraq, he was one of the participants in the battles in Iraq, and he was one of the leaders in al qadisiyya in the 16th year of al hijra And to show you the quality of those young Sahabis, Al-Miswar, it was the habit on the old days when the two army come, usually, as a challenge to the other army, you bring with you all your valuables. You do not leave it at home. So, you, for example, let's talk. The horse of the king would be adorned with gold and silver is, as a challenge to show the others that, oh, we, we, we don't care. You won't be able to reach and to get it. So it was a big game. And uh, Al-Miswar, in this battle, he found a trinket that was with gems and uh, jewels and he didn't know how valuable it was. But he saw a Persian guy, and he said to him, sell it for me for 10,000 dirham. So he knew it was valuable. He didn't keep it for himself. He took it to the, his cousin, to Sa'ad ibn Abi Waqqas. He said to him, look, I found this. This is, take it, receive it. And Sa'ad ibn Abi Waqqas said to him, take it, you take it. And as a gift from the leaders of the army. But don't sell it for 10,000. And later he sold it for 100,000 dirham. So it was very valuable. But this shows also the level of morality that he didn't take it for himself or embezzle it or hid it. And also, when uh, Sa'ad ibn Abi Waqqas sent the roots of the uh, battle to Medina, it was sent with Al Miswar, the Makhraman. And when Umar radiallahu anhu received these, he started crying. And Al Miswar narrated that when Umar started crying, we were surprised. Why you are crying? This is a day of happiness. And my uncle Abdul Rahman said to Umar, Don't cry, this is you should be very happy. And Umar radiallahu anhu said to him, Yes, I should be happy. But once wealth started coming into the people, they will start fighting. Once then, they will start becoming more interested in 
the glitters of this life other than the hereafter. In the year 17 of al Hijra, there was a drought in the Arabian Peninsula, and this is what we call in the uh, history Amur Maja, the year of the famine. Uh, and one of the people who were helping to overcome this, Umar bin Khattab basically, in, the, in this year, all the Bedouins came to around Medina because they, there is no substance for them to stay beyond uh, outside Medina. And they were waiting for help from the Muslim state. And Umar radiallahu made kitchens, similar to what we call today soup kitchens, to feed those uh, thousands who came to Medina. And one of the people whom Umar assigned for this task was al miswar ibn Mahra. And uh, al miswar said, one of the intentions of Umar, if the famine continued for more than that year, he said, my intention was to uh, partner every family that came from outside Medina from one family inside Medina. So they live together, and they share the food together, and they live together. al miswar was of a very generous nature. And very, he learned from Umar al Khattab to be very cautious, also as we spoke earlier. And he was a trader, a businessman. So one time, he imported some food to Medina. And usually, as a, if you are in food business, when the prices goes up, go up, when there is a shortage, if there is a surplus, the price goes down. Usually, every, and if you are in a country that is dry like uh, the Arabian Peninsula. What, how do you judge the weather? By the clouds. If there is rain, even uh, I, I originally I'm from Syria, and usually in Syria, counterintuitive, but when you think about it, if there is rain, the price of meat goes up, not down. Why? Because people don't sell. The, those who are, have the cattle, they will not sell. Now they have feed for their cattle. Why to sell it? They sell it only if there is a drought. They sell it very quickly. <laughs> so al Miswar saw a cloud coming to Medina, and he thought now the prices will go down. The price of the cattle may uh, go up, but the price of food itself will become cheap. So, and he hated this. He said, oh, my business is not going to succeed. Now I'm going to lose money. After that, he thought, but I'm, why I'm thinking this? I want to harm the people for my own benefit. And as a compensation for this, to seek the forgiveness of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, the next day he went to the bazaar and he said, my, the food is free. All this is free for you. Anyone who comes, I will give it to And Umar ibn Khattab heard about this. He said, are you crazy? Did you lose your mind? What are you doing? Why are you giving this away? And he explained to him, I said, yesterday when I saw the cloud, I hated that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala sent rain. And as a compensation, I said, let me give all this money for the sake of Allah so he can forgive me because I have some bad intentions against my brother. So this is the, uh, again, Al-Miswar was very keen about consequences. He learned this from Umar radiallahu anhu. Umar, would notice things that others may not notice. One time, uh, Al Miswar was in the marketplace, and the prayers, the time of the prayers came, and a man was leading the prayer, was put forward to lead the prayers, but he had some defects with his pronunciation. He was not pronouncing correctly. So Al Miswar came forward and said to him, Go back. Let someone else lead the prayer. <coughs> and this man became angry because this is, if you look at it on the face of it, it's an insult. Why did you do this to me? He went to Umar and complained. Why? And Umar brought al miswar Why you are you doing this? This is human nature. Some of us may not uh, have good pronunciation. And he said to him, al miswar said to him, I wanted something. I, I, never, I had no personal thing against this uh, brother. It was for the benefit or for the common good of all Muslims. He said to him, we were not in Medina. This was outside Medina. Most of the people did not hear the Quran. So if they hear him reciting this way, they will think this is the recitation. This is the way to recite. 
and I wanted them to learn how to, when they hear the Imam to be, to know the recite, the correct recitation. And Omar said, well, you did the right thing. So, this is the, the close relationship between al Miswar and Omar was to the extent that when Omar was uh, attacked and he lost conscious, the Sahaba at that time were debating, how can we wake up Omar? And I'm sure most of you know that one of the Sahaba suggested, say, remind him about the prayers, say to him, as salah and he will wake up. Who did this? al Miswar. It was, he suggested to them, if you want to wake up Omar, say to him, as salah He will wake up. So this is al, al, al Miswar. And though he was a junior Sahabi, he was uh, after the death of Omar. As we know, Omar left the issue of his succession to uh, eight Sahabis. And basically, he was, uh, Abdul Rahman ibn Awf, who singled himself out. He said, I am not interested in this Khilafa issue. He was the mediator. And Al Miswar was his right hand in this process. And there are many uh, issues about this. But Al Miswar also did not remain in Medina. The second generation of the Sahaba, the young generation, he went to Iraq. Later, in the days of Uthman, he went to what the countries that we call today Libya and Tunisia. The Arabs of the time, they would call it Ifriqiya. They consider this is, in the books of history, Ifriqiya is basically Tunis and uh, Alge uh, Libya, Tunisia, and Algeria. And after the death of Osman, Al Miswar was also very close to Ali and Abi Talib. And he went to him with, uh, to Kufa because Ali moved from Medina, which was the capital, to Iraq. The majority of Muslims left the Arabian Peninsula and the way they moved to Iraq. And the Khalifa Ali thought it would be appropriate to move to. Iraq and he moved to Al Kufa. And also, he was an advisor to Ali. Gave him very sound advice that he learned from his uh, days with Umar ibn Khattab or with his uncle Abdul Rahman ibn Awf, who was a very uh, successful merchant. He said, I saw uh, Ali radiallahu anh, giving people their salaries. So he, had, he was sitting in this place. There is a door here and a door there. And people would, in a queue on this door, they would come and the Ali would give them their salary and they would leave the next, from the next door. But there was no record, no books, nothing. And he said to him, I said to Ali, but what about people coming again to get a double salary? <laughs> and this gives us an indication that this in the days of the Prophet wasallam was unthinkable. The Sahaba will not do this. Once you have another generation, another generation, uh, the feeling and the commitment wane. So uh, Ali asked him, did someone do this? He said, yes, I saw someone coming again. <coughs> so Ali said, no, stop, let's try it. Make a record. So this was one of the early uh, records that was made in Islam for, for this. And uh, again, al Miswar. Uh, lived with Ali radiallahu anh, as we said, and he, Ali sent him as when they, they, they had, Ali and Muawiyah had this agreement, Al Miswar was sent by Ali as his messenger to Muawiyah. So that shows the trust and the confidence that Ali radiallahu anh, had with Al Miswar. And after that, in the days of uh, Muawiyah, Al Miswar was ranked as a faqih like Abdullah ibn Abbas, Abdullah ibn Umar, the young Sahabis who were young when the Prophet wasallam died. Now they were in their 40s and uh, 50s, some of them, early 50s. So he was considered to be a, a scholar. And he was very close to Abdullah ibn Abbas. They would have discussions, argument about issues. And uh, one of the issues, for example, that he disagreed with Abdullah ibn Abbas about when you go for Umrah or Hajj, 
when you put the cloth of ihram, are you allowed to have a shower or not? Al Miswar, who narrated this hadith, he said, I was of the opinion that you are not allowed. This is my recollection. And Abdullah bin Abbas said to him, No, you are allowed. So, what they did, they went to one of the wives of the Prophet وسلم, to ask her. And she said, Yes, the Prophet made a shower in my tent. So, he narrated the hadith, not that because he, it was not his opinion, he was wrong, he hid this hadith and didn't convey it. He narrated this hadith. And he also was keen to ensure that the next generation were good practicing Muslims, people who realize the importance of what they are doing. At one time, he saw a young man praying in the mosque. But his prayer was super fast. Very quickly, he finished the prayer. And Al Miswar said to him, Go again, pray, pray. He said to him, I just finished my prayer. And Al Miswar said to him, No, you didn't pray. And I'm not going to leave you till you pray a decent prayer. What you prayed was a very not proper prayer. So he said to him, I'm not going to let young people like you do this while I'm alive. I need to guide you, I need to give you this. And also, uh, so, in many cases, Al Miswar, when he, after that, he was always objecting to any injustice that he saw. And one of the examples we I, we have many examples, but let's look. Uh, one of the examples is that the governor of Medina, Marwan ibn al-Hakam, he built his home in Medina, a nice maybe mansion, and he invited people to it. And al-Miswar came with the people. And the governor was talking to the people. He said to them, look, this is all my own man. I never took a penny from the Muslim treasure. This is my old man. And al Miswar, who knew him very well, didn't believe him. So he said to him, maybe it would have been better for you to let us eat your food and keep silent. <laughs> because when we were in Africa, when we were, you were not that rich. So, and, uh, but you became rich because Uthman ibn Affan assigned you to become a collector of zakat. A collector of zakat can take a part for himself or for the group that collects the zakat. Well, Amirin alayhim, one of the people. So he said to him, because of the zakat you have been rich, not because of your own genius, sort of. Uh, and one of the uh, issues that uh, it shows how pious he was that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala supported him. At one time, Al Miswar was asked to judge about an issue. And he, his opinion about this issue was a certain opinion, and, but the governor, the Marwan ibn Hakam, had a different opinion, and he said, this is my decision. And Al Miswar came to him and objected to him. He said to him, no, this is not right. The governor said to, to the security, what we may call to the security, take him out. So he was taken out. And then Marwan said, when I sleep, when I slept, I saw someone in my dreams coming to me and says, كُلٌّ يَعْمَلُ عَلَى شَاكِلَةِ The verse in the Quran, كُلٌّ يَعْمَلُ عَلَى شَاكِلَةِ وَفَرَبُّكُمْ أَعْلَمُ بِمَنْ هُوَ Then the same person who was reciting this verse said to me, why are you are bothering Miswar? So he realized that this is a sign from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And he immediately released him. He said, please forgive me. I did not. So this shows again the relationship in the Sahaba. And Miswar after that, he was close to the children of Ali radiallahu anhu, al-Hasan and al Hussein. He was very supportive of their father and supportive of themselves. And there are many examples of this. Uh, again, for the shortage of time, maybe we will give one example only. He said, he was asked, why do you so much like the children of Fatima, 
Al Hassan and Al Hussein. What is special about them? And he said because one time Ali ibn Abi Talib, their father, wanted to marry the daughter of Abu Jahl, who was the enemy of Islam, his cousin, his uh, uncle. And when I, I, I was just a young man, when I heard the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam on the pulpit say that Fatima is part of me, and whatever harms her, harms me. And I do not want my daughter and the daughter of the enemy of Islam to be in one house. And then I don't want her to be angry, with, to be always fighting with the, with the uh, daughter of Abu Jahl. And then the Prophet وسلم, praised his other son-in-law, the husband of Zainab, Al-As ibn Abi Rabi'ah. He said he was very kind to me though he became a Muslim later in his life. Uh, and the Prophet said, I'm not going to say this is haram, this is halal. What Ali wants to do is halal. And I'm not going to forbid uh, to say haram to something halal, but this is what my feeling. And because of this, he said, I like the children of Fatima because the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam wanted uh, this. Now, in the year 60 of Al-Hijrah, Muawiyah died. And this was the first succession, official succession in Islam where the Khalifa basically assigned his successor who was a descendant of him, not someone else. When Umar died, when Abu Bakr died, he assigned uh, Umar. But he has no relation. It was purely on the merit basis. But Muawiyah assigned his son Yazid to be the uh, Khalifa after him. There were a big dissent among many Sahabis at that time. They disagreed. They said, no, we are not going to <coughs> do the bay'ah. We will not give the seal of approval to this succession. And among them were uh, al Hussein ibn Ali, the, and among them also Abdullah ibn Umar, the son of Umar, Abdullah ibn Zubayr, and uh, basically, Abdullah ibn Zubayr, and this didn't please Yazid. So he said to his governor in Medina, force them to give bay'ah, force them to give allegiance. Um, Abdullah ibn Umar said, once the others give bay'ah, I'm going to give bay'ah. Make me the last one. Uh, al Hussein and Abdullah ibn Zubayr left Medina and went to Mecca. This was the start of a dissent movement, or a, and with him went Al Miswar ibn Mahram. They went to Mecca and remained in Mecca without revolting, basically living in Mecca, but did not give the oath of allegiance. And when the Sahabis, other Sahabis, and other Muslims heard about Abdullah ibn Zubayr, many people came to him to Mecca, and. Among them were the Khawarij also, those who basically later would uh, disagree with Ali, and they disagreed with Ali already and Muawiyah. And Abdullah ibn Zubair remained in Mecca for 10 years. In the year 71 of Al Hijrah, he proclaimed himself to be the Khalifa and he started. Before that, he was like an ordinary person, but he has a group around him. And at that time, this was basically a heralding a conflict between the Muslims. And uh, before that, in the year 64 of Al Hijra, Yazid wanted to control what is known today as Mecca and Medina, Hijaz, the Hijaz area. So he sent an army that went to Medina and conquered Medina, and after that, they continued to Mecca and to fight uh, Ibn Zubair, uh, Abdullah Ibn Zubair in Mecca, and al Miswar was with him at that time. And this shows us that when we as Muslims have interests, personal interests, not, we are not looking at things from uh, the common interest of the people, we will always have problems. We will always uh, have people who prefer uh, to put their own personal interest ahead of the interest of the owner. And 
basically this army who, which, that reached Mecca uh, besieged the Haram. And the fighting was not very intense fighting. But at the same time, Al Miswar was very well respected even by the army coming from, uh, from, the, uh, from Yazid, because he was known to be a pious person and a fair person. And then the, the siege continued for some time, and they started uh, feeling that they need to break the stalemate. How to break the stalemate? And this was the first time when the haram was basically hit by stones. So they brought, uh, uh, I forgot the name, the English name of the machines. Cannonball. Yeah, cannonball. Or basically, you, a sling, like a, a huge sling, and you put a stone and you throw the stone to the uh, haram. And uh, it was the habit of Abdullah ibn Zubair and Miswar ibn Mahram, all the Sahabis, to make tawaf around the Kaaba. So when the uh, stones were very heavy, the attack was heavy, some people advised them not to do this. He said, no, I'm going, this was my practice, I'm going to do it every day. And uh, he did this, and when he was doing the tawaf, he was hit with a stone, and he became ill, and he died after five days in the battle. Now, it shows how trivial was the battle of the issues and how could, if there were wise people on both sides, they could have maybe resolved the problem. And if we have resorted to Shura, the problem could have been resolved. Because the sadness was not only on the side of Al-Miswar, the sadness even in the army coming, uh, the besieging army was sad that Al-Miswar was killed. So why are you throwing stones if you are sad about this? And basically, they said, let's have a truce. We want also to participate in the Salah, Janaza. So both armies joined the Janaza for Al Miswar ibn uh, Mahrama because of this. This was not the end of the story. Al Miswar ibn Mahrama, even among his children, you have scholars also. And his first and eldest son was a, a scholar and on his own stand, with his own standing. And he has also a daughter that narrated some of his hadith. So again, the transmission, the succession from a scholarly perspective did not stop. Those who were around him uh, always carried his message and carried also his knowledge to the other uh, generation. This is the biography of one Sahabi, and there are many biographies. As I said earlier, he is a junior Sahabi. Many of you would not have heard his name. But it's very important when we look at the history of Islam not to overlook the role of the other generations after the senior Sahabis and the importance of looking at the young and the youth among us and to prepare them for the future. Because in this case, we saw that Al Miswar, uh, his, uh, he learned from his uncle, Abdul Rahman ibn Awf, from Awar al Khattab. So in the future, he became the leader of Muslim and a great scholar of his time. Uh, maybe we conclude to give uh, another glimpse about his personality uh, from a fiqh perspective. He would not drink water. If you go to Muslim countries, not today, but in, uh, in old time, if you go to a Muslim, the mosque in the Muslim country, you will see a jug made of clay, a large jug, and you drink water from it, basically. And Miswar would, would not drink from this water. Why? He said, this is a sadaqah for the needy and the poor. I am not poor. So this is to show how pious he was, that he does not, he feels that he takes something, and we spoke about him giving away the food completely. So this is the caliber. It's not only the senior Sahabis, but this was, there were generations after generations, this kind of piety continues even today in the Muslim Ummah. And he was also very humble, because once you become 
in your 50s and 60s, in his case, he became an important Sahabi for the generation that came. And he used to say to the people around him, look, now you see me like I'm leading the gathering and I'm uh, the scholar and this, but if I'm talking about people, if, I, if they were today here, I would be nothing. I would be hesitant even to say one word. So he reminded them that he owes all of this to the first generation of the Sahaba of the Prophet I hope that with this review it gives us a different perspective about the second generations of Muslims and I pray to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to enable us to follow their examples uh, so we can be successful in this life and in the hereafter. Wassalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa Digital age. Yes, exactly. You know, you don't try.